Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Amen. For one of the greatest days on the face of the earth for a Christian. If you got your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you could. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Mm -hmm. All right, when you get there, we'll start in verse 12. Read down. 1 Corinthians 15. I know a lot of you folks probably got food in the oven or the crock pot or some kind of thing out there, you know. But again, I want to welcome all the first-time visitors and some second-time visitors and third-time visitors. You're always welcome any Sunday and every Sunday. Amen? All right, hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If we look at, start at verse 12, chapter 15 starting at verse 12, we'll start there. I'm going to share something. I'm going to kind of preach a message with no hope. By the end of the message, we'll have hope. Amen? It says here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 12, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if, there's no, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also in vain? Uh, yea, and we are found, uh, found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he had raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Look at verse 18. Then they are which are fallen asleep, and Christ are perished. If, look at, if this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ uh, risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man come also the resurrection of the dead. I want to share with you quickly here, there's a battle going on way back in that day. People didn't believe that Christ rose from the dead. Even though the event happened in history, there is a predicament in the church in Corinth, and you'll see in another part I'm going to share with you, all through the Bible, the controversy was going on even in the days when the Bible was being put together and written on, on, uh, on, on as the books were being written by the Apostle Paul and other, other, other people like Peter and so forth, the, and Paul to Timothy, you're going to see that a little bit here. Even back then, the battle was on to nullify one of the greatest events of Christianity. God sent his only begotten son to come from the cross, look at now, from the cross to an empty tomb so that the empty heart can be saved and born again, amen? It was already planned, the redemption plan was already there. And people, even back then, in this day, with the false teaching and, and contrary to the word of God and the word of truth, they're already trying to nullify the truth that our Savior rose again, amen? Talk about this no resurrection. And Paul had to deal with it Right head on. Now I'm going to tell you something. To this day, the hope of this world rests on this. The hope of this world, if every lost person does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior, rests on this. We hear the unsaved, we hear the, the gainsayer, we hear the, the person that is optimistic and agnostic and atheist sit there saying, to this day, I don't believe in God. I don't believe this really happened. Someone stole the body, but I'm going to tell you this morning, it takes some faith. It takes there's historical evidence. You look, read the book of Josephus. It's a Jewish historian, historian talks about this event really truly happened. Religions were based on this thing. So I'm going to preach a message a little bit here to kind of get you not confused, but to share with you the hurt, the chaos, if there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, what will we do? If there's no resurrection, where are we going to go? I'm going to share with you this morning just that dilemma. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you so much for this morning. I pray that you have blessed this message. Holy Spirit, I pray you go ahead and just take over the whole entire sermon to help us look at erasing some of those doubts, some of those things we lack in faith, some of the things we don't trust. But Lord, believe what you said in the Word. Believe the evidence that was given to all humanity of the day that we can sit there and realize that you came, it was fulfilled that you came where we celebrate Christmas, the birth of you. We also realize the point where we have, every religion has you hanging on a cross and bleeding for you could die for the whole world for their sins. 
But Lord, also how you sealed it, how you rose again and took care of business by proving of that prophecy that you came to die for us, but also you rose again to defeat hell, death, the grave, and all such. Lord, we can have eternal life. Lord, I pray you bless this time now. We bless this message. Have your will and way now. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul had to deal with this way here in, in, in this church of Corinth. It was already the gainsayers coming. Already doubt was coming into the congregation. People were being deferred and deterred to a false doctrine of Christ not being risen. Back in the day, Paul had to raise up a, a man called Timothy. Turn real quick into 2 Timothy, if you could. 2 Timothy, way in the back. If, if you don't have your Bible, I hope someone will share with you next year. If there's someone next year you don't have a Bible, maybe you can share with them so they can also see the Scriptures. I'm showing here in the Bible that even back in the day, this dilemma was going on. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. When you get there, want you, if you could look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 17 if you could. And there's two men already going ahead causing disruption, causing dissension, causing already false teaching here in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, look at verse 17. It says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth, concerning the truth have erred, seeing that, that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Meaning this resurrection is a big event in history, this big event that was going on here where everybody was telling, hey, he's risen, he's no longer dead. And what it caused was that the Christians were going out there that believed, they saw Jesus face to face, that believed and trusted him because they saw like Doubting Thomas. Even Downing Thomas had an issue with that until he fed to feel the, the spear, the wholeness with the spear went in. And the nails, they were driven in his hand, they had to touch that. They had to sit there and believe. All the apostles, when Peter was fishing, all of a sudden the fishing was going on. And, and they saw Jesus at the, at the shore. Confirmation after confirmation, witness after witness. And then that was all done away. And now the message was in the hands of every apostle, every disciple, every believer to share that we have a God that fulfilled prophecy. That he died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day. That's why when you read the New Testament, they talk about, about Jonah and the whale, right? How many days was he in the, in the belly of the whale? Three. Three days and three nights, right? Just like the grave. Christ was in the earth three days and three nights. It was prophetic, even with the story with Jonah and the whale. And so when I tell you this this morning here, is that they're sitting there, Telling us all over, it's no big deal. And they're trying to get people to continue believing the law and just, just this Messiah, but not the fulfillment, the seal, the deal, the confirmation that separates every other teaching, every other doctrine, every other belief system. And that is Christ rose from the dead and he's alive. It's kind of hard to go ahead and sit there and believe in something like that, right? Well, it's true. But the problem is it's truth. He's alive. It goes on here in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 2, if you could. And I want you to look real quickly, if you could. Again, as we were as reading here, that in, uh, in verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I'm going to tell you this right now. It transferred, again, like I said, it went from the cross to an empty tomb to an empty heart. Write that down. You get that one? I just made that up. Actually, I didn't. The Holy Spirit gave me that. From the cross to an empty tomb to an empty heart. We just sing, uh, He lives, right? Remember we just sing, He lives? Where does it, and then of course it goes on, how do you know that He lives? Because He lives where now? In my heart. When a person gets saved and born again, you can start seeing him work in your life, and he's alive, he's, he's blessing your life, he's guiding your life, he's protecting your life, he's showing you things that only God can reveal and see as you go out and walk with him, because you're saved and born again. You got saved and born again, so he's alive and well. You can't physically see it, but when you got saved and born again, the Holy Spirit gives you confirmation, you see God working. If you're here this morning and you haven't seen God work in your life, you haven't seen how he's in there in, that light, in your heart, guess what? You have the opportunity to get saved and born again today. You can see what every believer has by faith. We're no touch, no sight, but what he does in your life because he's in your heart. Amen? Because he's in your heart. This morning, there was a, a teaching going on. There was a great attack. 
there's a, a great counterfeit that there was no resurrection. They try to diffuse it. That's how Satan works, doesn't he? When truth's out there and there's a great event that happens on that God is in the midst of it all and God's blessed and revealing things where people are getting saved and all that kind of stuff, it's amazing how the devil gets in there and gives counterfeits, changes people's direction, they start getting enticed and they go somewhere else. Can I tell you number one, if you look at verse, go back if you could, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There was three things here that was, I, I want you to notice that was uh, said by Paul to this church in Corinth. There was three things that was said. First thing is that if you look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want you if you could look at verse 14, it says this. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14 says, and, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, look at now, and your faith is also in vain. So why in the world what we believe in it? See, when you get saved and born again you, and you put your faith in Christ Jesus, what he did on the cross, on the cross of Calvary, which is an event that, that people know has happened. But it was sealed. What he did on that cross was sealed when he was buried the third day and rose again to seal the deal. To show that the confirmation, what he did on the cross, is different from any other. Any other crucifixion, any other death. Look at any other belief system, any other teaching that people put their faith in, even yourself. There's nothing that separate. Listen, there's nothing that can compare to what Christ has done on that cross, but nothing compared to what Christ has done in that tomb. Amen. Nothing can. And if you were to take it to the court system, if you were to take it to the court system under, under judicial review, under scrutiny, the amount of witnesses that were there, Jesus will win the case. Just think about that. All the truths and all the prophecies that line up that it would happen, all the witnesses that were there, Mary Magdalene in the, in the garden of Psalm, uh, sitting right there, he, he thought he was a soldier. Peter saw him on, a, uh, on the shore when they were fishing. Downey Thomas had to touch him. We go on and on and on. Paul on the road to Damascus. But somehow, there was a teaching going on that there was no resurrection. To try to nullify the power that was in the resurrection that giveth life. Power that is in the resurrection that giveth great faith. And here, if, if we, what, am I, what am I here today preaching for? What am I preaching for if, if, if that didn't happen, if there was no resurrection? What would your faith stand upon? Are you going to go back and depend on your strength? You're going to get weak. Our strength is not like his power. The power of his resurrection is strong. We get tired, we get weary. Keep putting faith in yourself. You're going to keep the, the, the disappointing yourself. I'd rather put faith in Christ. Amen? He'll help you. He'll show you and give you great wisdom. He'll teach you great things. And you'll overcome things. And you'll see things that you never saw before that you don't fall in the same dangers that you did when you depended and put faith in yourself or a system, anything but Christ. This morning, can I tell you, that here in John chapter 20, verse 2, you have to turn there. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. That was the predicament. That was the issue. But we know what happened, right? If we go ahead and look at ver uh, the very beginning of this chapter here, 1 Corinthians 15, look at the first four verses of what they say. And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. He's reconfirming the point of salvation, amen? He's going back to the point of knowing that he's saved. Number two, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Something happened here. A great event happened in history that they all heard it just happened. It was in their presence. They just saw the man be crucified. They just saw the man, people say, I saw him, he's risen from the dead. And somehow people already forgot about the great event. It's almost similar to what happened in 9-11, remember? People are like, it's not no big deal, not, nothing about, no big deal, 9-11 happened, who cares? What are you talking about, who cares? It was probably a time in our nation where we finally got on our knees and asked God to heal our nation, protect our nation. It kind of woke us up for a little bit. But because we're so de desensitized, that we don't realize that our faith has been attacked and dwindled and numbed. Can I tell you this morning? Listen. What he did was true. 
what was happened is great. Can I tell you this morning, I wanted to declare to you that our faith is not dwindled. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Power! Power of the resurrection. And it takes faith. Every human being has faith in something or somebody. Can I tell you this morning? You can never go wrong when you put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? People put faith in yourselves, put faith in the government, put faith in institutions, put faith in religion. Do you hear what I said? Religion. I put faith in a person. You know why? Because he showed his power over something. I'm going to put faith in that person. Amen? Hallelujah, right? So listen, I want to let you know some things here. If there's no resurrection, our faith is in vain. Number two, it says here in verse 17, go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, if you look at it real quickly, if you could, in verse 17. It says here in verse 17, it says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. And look at it, ye are yet in your sins. Remember when your sins were weighing heavy on you? Remember when your sins were wearing on you and destroying you and, and caused you more than what you can afford? Right? It may have ruined your marriage, it ruined your family, ruined your life, put you in a hospital, almost put you in the grave. Hallelujah, I remember that, right? But praise the Lord, listen now, look at, praise the Lord when Christ came along. Hallelujah, right? He took care of that business. We would be, listen, if we were still in our sins, we'd be in a heap of trouble. In Romans chapter 4, verse 24 and 25 says this, But for us also, to him it will be imputed. If we believe on him, they raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Hallelujah. When God forgives us and pardons us, right? Look here. When God forgives us and pardons us, listen, it's gone. The Lord Jesus Christ is not like other people. He won't throw it back in your face. He won't relive it. He won't bring up your memories. He won't give you flashbacks how awful of sin that we committed. He's, he's forgiven you. It's been justified. It's been paid. And there's no more offense. No more offense. Hallelujah to that. Amen? John chapter 8, verse 21 says this, Then, G then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, you cannot come. You need to listen. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by him. Once you realize that your sin is the thing that's hindering you to get, to get a hold of Jesus, then you see the need to get saved. When you realize that your faith that you have, that you say you have in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you say that your sin is the one that's hindering your faith to put your total trust in how powerful he is and how amazing our Lord is, that separates from any other person you want to put your faith in, yourself or anybody else, you're missing out on the great blessing. You're missing out how, how great of a power of his resurrection. I stand here today, and some of you here stand today, can sit there, we could talk about our past all we want and how horrible it was, but you know what the difference was in our life? Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one that rose from the dead. We would not be here today if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. It separates us from everybody else. Number three. Look here in verse 19 if you could. Same, cha the same chapter. If in this life only we have hope in Christ. Look at now. I want, this is a profound statement real quickly here. Look at it. It says here, if in this life only have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Wait a minute. Isn't that what we need is Christ? No, no, no. We're talking about a Christ that has no resurrection. Do you see that verse right there? If we only had Christ with no resurrection, all you're doing is putting trust in a man. That's no different from you and I. What separated him and us is this. He said he was the, the God-man, the man Christ Jesus, between us, a mediator between us and God. He came down to die for us and sealed it and proved that what he said he was going to do when he was on the earth, doing all those miracles, that I'm going to rise again the third day and we're going to build this thing up. People are like, what, a church building? He goes, no, 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 you. Christ builds us up. Once we get saved, we're in, he builds us up. This morning I want to let you know, look at you can believe in Christ, but you better believe in the one that rose from the dead. Because there's a lot of antichrist. There's a whole bunch of them. I could, I could be all day naming a whole bunch of them. Then the, look, at, there's a whole bunch that call themselves Jesus. There's, there's a whole bunch of people that call, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. Well, guess what? They're still in the grave. 
They didn't rise again. People followed them. They were false of being led and they were being deceived. They were in a cult and they were following them and they thought they were the Messiah. They gave all their money. They gave their children to them. All kinds of stuff. It was scary. That's so scary. Now listen, I, I do some investigation. I was looking and doing some research and this thing came up. I remember, um, what's this, how you pronounce it? Jaquana Phoenix? What's his name? River? Not, no, is. The one that walked the line, played Johnny Cash. Huh? Yeah, what kind of Phoenix? Do you know that he was, he was raised in a cult? And he followed the guy that said he was Jesus in the flesh. That's, that's, I'm thinking, like, wow! And a dude, you know what, he committed suicide. That's the scary part that goes on here. But can I tell you something? Once you know the real Jesus, and once you know the power of his resurrection, you're no longer deceived. You got truth, you got the power of resurrection, you're not going to fall into a cult, you're not gonna, you got the Lord, you got the real deal. And you can see how it works in your heart. Praise the Lord for that one, right? Can I tell you this morning, we won't be most, mis most miserable, we won't be a people that are most miserable. We're going to believe the Christ that rose again. We're going to the Christ that confirmed and fulfilled all prophecy. We're going to believe in a, a live, a man that's alive, that when you get saved and born again, lives in your heart. Here in Romans chapter 6, 5 and 6 says this, For if we have been planted together... In the likeness of his death, we also, look at we, we be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Hallelujah to that. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. This body is going to keep falling into sin and falling into falsehood. It's easy, let me tell you, is it easier to believe a lie than a truth? It is, isn't it? We gravitate to anything that's false. False about somebody else? Just we love gossip. We love slander. We love falsehood. Because they just make, really? It really happened? <gasps> tell me more. But when you go to somebody and say, listen, I'm going to tell you something. There's this man came, Christ Jesus, that was buried, and he rose again. I don't believe that, man. But it's the truth. I don't know about all that. And now it's like, who, how can you believe something like that in nature? Because it's God. It's God. Amen? It's God. Ready? So what's the, big, what's the big deal about all this? Well, listen. The tomb was empty. There was many witnesses. Can I tell you one other fact that you don't realize here? When, when, the tomb, look at, when Christ died and the tomb was empty and many witnesses saw, there was an event that happened right afterwards. You want to tell me real quick? I'm going to tell you real quick what happened. You ready? Christianity exploded. Right? Starting in the first chapter of the book of Acts, all of a sudden, people started believing. There was a great his other historical fact in history that people were getting saved and born again, worshiping pagan stuff and all kinds of stuff. It became huge. Christians got saved left and right. People were getting born again, becoming Christians, becoming part of the family of God, right? Now, I want you to think about that. To this day right here, Christianity still has the highest percentage in the world today. It's being attacked, but it's still, it's still the biggest thing today. When you sit there and you go to other foreign countries, we're going to talk about this too, English is, don't speak French in France, because you'll get ridiculed and laughed at. Just speak English. It's amazing how they know that. Because when, when the Bibles went around there, it wasn't in French, it was in English. The King's English. So I want to let you know, listen, I'm going to tell you something this morning. There was, there was a lot going on there, and there's a historical fact that we, you, people sit there and want to nullify the history of his resurrection. So in conclusion, I want to share these, these simple things with you real quick here. I want to assure you, look at now, our foundation is sure, amen? If you're saved and born again today, I want to let you know that your foundation as a Christian is sure the event that happened is for real. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2 here. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'll give you a chance to go ahead and look at that real quick. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read. Your foundation is sure. It's not, it doesn't have to be attacked. It's for real. In Ephesians chapter 2. And when you get the chance to get over there, I want you to look at verse 13. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, But now, in Christ Jesus... Ye whom sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, 
who hath made both one, and he hath broken down the middle wall, a partition between us, having abolished in his, his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself a twain one new man, so make him peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God and in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to who were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Hallelujah. And it goes on a little bit further here. It goes, for though in him both have access by one spirit, look at now, by one spirit, by one spirit, Unto the Father. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God, and are again are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. I want to stop right there to get my point across. The prophets were Old Testament. They were preaching Christ coming to die on a cross and he rose again. The apostles. We're getting ready for it, and it happened. They carried on even after the resurrection. Their foundation and doctrine has been carried on tremendously. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fit framely together, groweth in the holy temple of the Lord, in whom we are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Prophecy was maintained. God's promise was kept. Amen? People sit there and say, well, I can't believe in God because God doesn't keep promises. He did. It's us that don't keep the promises. He, he does. He keeps them. He goes on. Our faith is real. People put faith in a lot of things, and it falls apart. But our faith is real. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 says this, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. I have not seen one person. you got all these self-help things on TV. And if people put faith in all that stuff, they put wisdom in men, they go to college, and they, they get to hear all the professors, they go to these seminars, and they get all this information. I'm going to tell you something. Look up here. I had a person tell me this past week, I've gone this, try to help my life. I had even hired a life coach. I've done this, and I'm telling you, I still i am not getting what I'm looking for. If you've got that kind of money to buy a life coach, I don't know what, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I still, I've gone to this seminar, I've gone to here, I'm fighting depression, I'm, I'm struggling in life, I don't know what to do with myself, I have no purpose. That's what that, that person was telling me. I go, I go, I even hired a life coach for one year. Well, what did that life coach do? Help me in my physical being. Help me in my mental be being. And even my spiritual. And I go, where did it get you? I go, no, where I still have answers. I have no answer. I still don't feel complete. I said, did you ever find Jesus yet? I knew you were going to go there. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what she said. I knew you were going to go there. Well, what am I going to say? It's the truth, right? It's the truth. Because you keep putting your faith in a system. You're putting your faith in a curriculum. You're putting your faith in a person. Your people will fail you. You will fail you. Can I tell you where the true purpose is? Can I tell you where the real answer is? It's in, a, it's in the person of Christ Jesus. Where faith is there, where true power. Here's another one I want you to think about here. Doesn't it feel good to be forgiven? I don't know how bad your life was before you came to Christ, but boy, man, whoo! Listen, I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to go back to my old life. I don't want to go back to my old man. Because when, listen, when he died and put it to death, it's the old man's dead, hallelujah, right? But when he rose again, he gave me life, he gave me a new man. I became a new man in Christ Jesus. I want that new life. Because you know why? It feels good being forgiven. Matter of fact, it feels great being forgiven. Whoo, hallelujah. It's a good thing. It's good being forgiven. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, it said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Even, look at now, think about this. He's on the cross dying. He's ready to give up the ghost. And he even had enough in the pain and agony and ready to take place everything, all the sins of the whole world upon him. He even had enough love to go endure the pain and say, Father, forgive them. Whew. That's pretty deep, ain't it? And then he continued on the course and fulfilled his promise by going to that grave three days to rise again. Let the whole world know he's alive. Can I tell you, your foundation is sure, your faith is real, and forgiveness has been accomplished. Look at now, knowing all that, knowing all that, 
That means your future with the Lord, a resurrected Christ, a Savior that's been resurrected, that your future is secure. You have a blessed assurance. Amen? Jesus is mine. Oh, for a foretaste divine. Hallelujah. Your faith is secure. So what do you mean by that, Pastor I'm just trying to say this. In John chapter 6, verse 37, he says, I'll know why it's cast out. Hallelujah that, right? You know why it's cast out. In Mark chapter 16, verse 6, says this, And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. Look at now. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. He was, he, it was confirmed. He's not here. He's risen. Hallelujah. And all the generations that would not come to Christ and believe or scratching their head, trying to figure out things, won't believe and come to Christ. Can I tell you this morning? I want you to realize that Jesus is real. What he did on the cross is for real. There's evidence, there's historical fact, but also, can I tell you something? The resurrection from the dead, him being buried and rose again the third day, is for real. So what did he do? Let me give it to you in a nutshell, and I'll close. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Our, listen, Christianity, true Christians that are real, true Christians that want to live right, true Christians that want to sit there and follow and seek after them day in and day out. Can I tell you this morning, that type of Christian, I'm going to let you know that, hey, listen, you don't have to be a fright. You don't have to doubt your faith. You don't, you've got a foundation that's sure. You have a faith that's real. Your forgiveness has been accomplished and your future is secure. What he did at that grave is he did this. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 says this. I am he that liveth. <laughs> I am he that liveth. Someone can listen. When, when you, listen, you got this message today I'm preaching to you. Now listen, I know this is a hodgepodge message. Let me tell you. We do, we do like a garbage plate all the time here, Amen. <laughs> but can I tell you this morning, if God's knocking on your heart, he's saying, hey, it's me that liveth. I am he that liveth. If you're here this morning and you're not saved and born again, I beg and I plead, I want you to know this one that we preach about. So your faith is not in vain. That you can have a blessed hope knowing that you're believing the same kind of one that we're believing in, the Messiah, a Savior that rose again because of that power resurrection. You're going through things in your life. You're having struggles you can't overcome. We can tell you about the power of his resurrection, but you must believe first. You must come to Christ. Because I am he that believeth and was dead. He says, listen, I was the one that was dead. I'm he that lived, but I was the one dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. There's your future promise. I am alive forevermore. Amen. And, hey, look at, and have the keys of hell and of death. When you get saved and born again, do you know what? You pass from death on to life. You're not, when a person is saved and born again, they don't see death. See this wretched body right here? Some of us were losing hair, right? Falling apart, right? Get the wrinkles, can't walk, can't get up, can't do nothing. Our body is going to crumble and turn to mush, but guess what? Our soul will live forevermore. Hell can't get us no more. The flames of hell might have been tickling your feet when you're lost and undone, but not no more. Because he holds the keys to hell and death. Amen. Amen. Because he's the answer. Look at now. If there's no resurrection, we would be in a heap of trouble. But guess what? There was one. <laughs> guess what? There was one. And that's what you have all that possessed. He is alive. Amen. And if you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior... You're missing out. I beg and I encourage you to say, I want what you got. I want what every Christian has, and that is Jesus in their heart to be saved and born again. I want to know about this Jesus that's alive forevermore and has the keys to hell and death. I want to be saved and born again. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Preacher, I heard your message this morning. And I'm thankful that I'm saved and born again and I believe in a Savior that's all-powerful because of his resurrection. How many of you can raise your hand and say, that's me? Look at all these things. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you're not saved and born again,
And you want to know about this thing called Christianity. You want to know about this thing, how to believe in, and believe in a God that's alive and well, that can come in my heart and save my soul and just give me life. Guide my life. Give me life forevermore. Then I want to encourage you to come. I'm going to be in the back over here in the hallway, and I want to let you know this morning no personal invitation, because I want to embarrass you in case you're a little afraid, but I'll, if you want to pull me aside and say, I want to know about this Jesus you're talking about, I'll be more than happy to show you in the Bible how to be saved and born again. The young man got saved yesterday. Amen, Vinny? The young man got saved in my office yesterday. Brother Mike, Noel, four weeks ago you planted the seed? God's been watering for four, almost four weeks at home. He goes, he goes, I'm done with this. I want to get saved. What that man told me four weeks ago, I want to get saved now. He came yesterday, I thought he'd come here to get food. I was going to give him a plate of food. He goes, I don't want no food. I want to get saved. That's a miracle. People always come here for food all the time. <laughs> this man didn't care about no food. He goes, I want to get saved. I said, that sounds good. Let's get in the office. Let's get busy. Noel got saved yesterday. Today, maybe might be another one that says, I want to get saved. I want that Jesus that's alive and well in my heart so I can be born again. Lord, thank you for this time. I pray you bless now this song of invitation. Lord, if you can touch a heart to give their life back to an all-powerful Savior that comes of the resurrection, or maybe a lost person that wants to come to Christ and be saved and born again, I pray that you would nudge their heart to say, I want to get saved and come forward. Lord, bless now this song in Jesus' name.